So as we continue our journey through cell respiration, let's just quickly recap what we've talked about so far. We first introduced cell respiration as the idea of taking energy from food and converting it into chemical energy that our bodies can use like ATP. But in order to do this, you have to go through several different steps and mechanisms and pathways. We've talked about glycolysis, which is the idea of splitting glucose into two molecules of G3P and then eventually turning those two G3P molecules into pyruvate. And in our previous video, we said that that pyruvate becomes octazized. It undergoes pyruvate oxidation into two molecules of acetylcoenzyme A. The next part to this cell respiration story is entitled citric acid cycle. So step three out of the four is called the citric acid cycle cycle. And it, of course, is going to involve the step previous to it, the product of the step previous to it, which were the two pyruvate molecules. Again, in order for simplicity's purpose, we're not going to use two molecules of pyruvate. We're instead just going to look at one molecule of pyruvate and see how the cycle works and just understand that, that this cycle then would happen again because there would be another molecule since we had one glucose molecule to start off with that's split into two separate entities. So again, it's very important, exams always like to ask this, where is the process occurring? Now we've moved on into the mitochondrial matrix. In our previous flowchart, our uh, process, pyruvate oxidation, was occurring in the mitochondrion, but specifically also in the mitochondrial matrix. We summarized that at the end. This is continuing in the mitochondrial matrix. So in order to sort of show the citric acid cycle, I think it's very hard to sort of present it in the way that I like the flowchart format. So I'm obviously I'm going to do something different. I'm going to actually just draw the cycle itself. Um, and we're going to start this cycle by creating sort of a big circle on this flowchart area right here. And we're going to circle it because this is a cycle. And what we have to remember, it's also sometimes called the Krebs cycle, just as a side note for the guy who invented it, um, not invented it, for the guy who discovered it, Hans Krebs. The citric acid is a, it's a cycle, citric acid cycle. So we're gonna start with something and then end with the same thing. And I'll prove that to you starting now. So what did we start with and what did we end with? We ended with, in the pyruvate oxidation step, acetylcoenzyme A. So we have acetylcoenzyme A, and what do we do with it? This is actually, now we're going to count carbons. So we're going to keep an eye on this. This is a two carbon molecule, and we're going to combine it with oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate is a four carbon molecule. So what does four carbons plus two carbons give us? It actually gives us um, six carbons, of course. And this is going to create a six carbon molecule known as citrate. This is why it's called the citric acid cycle. So it's a six carbon molecule, um, 6C, known as citrate. Um, sort of a sidestep to this. Uh, uh, sort of a byproduct is the idea that we actually, when we're doing this, there's an enzyme and diff different reactions that are going to cause this that, this combination and then the final product to occur. One of the side reactions and side steps is that we actually release acetylcoenzyme A, and that's something to remember. We lose acetylcoenzyme A, we can say, in step one. So this is step one. And then step two would be taking citrate. And once we have citrate, we're actually going to just turn it into something called isocitrate. That's our third product of the citric acid cycle. Isocitrate is just an isomer of citrate, iso, for that reason. It's just in a different shape, so we don't need to worry about the details behind it. It's still six carbons. Remember, we're keeping an eye on carbons for a specific reason. We have to make sure we get back into this four carbon state to combine with the two carbon molecule that came from where? Pyruvate oxidation. So we have isocitrate. The next molecule that's created is known as, and we'll say this is molecule number four that's created, is alpha-ketoglutarate. So alpha, that's the alpha symbol, ketoglutarate. This is a key step in the citric acid cycle because of the following byproducts that occur from creating isocitrate and turning into alpha-ketoglutarate. One of the key byproducts is um, this dehydrogenation that happens. We have NAD+, turning into, and you should know this by now, NADH. And again, remember, whenever you see any product, anything being made, you're going to remember that it happens again because there are two molecules of acetylcoenzyme A, and this is just one side of the story. So this is going to happen twice, of course. Not in the same molecule, but in the other molecule, um, as you might already understand. And another thing that happens is that we actually, um, through this process, release carbon dioxide. So let's keep 
track of the idea that we've made NADH right here and we've also released CO2 here, this is something that's gonna start showing up again. So we now have alpha ketoglutarate as our fourth molecule. We started all the way as acetylcholine-MA, combined it with oxaloacetate, got a six carbon citrate molecule. Then we turned it into an isomer, don't really care about this process that much. And then we used this idea of dehydrogenation to turn NAD into NADH, and we also released CO2 in the process to give us alpha ketoglutarate. If we lost CO2, we've lost a carbon. Now we no longer have a five carbon molecule. We no longer have a six carbon molecule, we of course have, and I already said it, a five carbon alpha ketoglutarate molecule. Next, we're going to create our fifth uh, step, or our fifth uh, product. And our fifth product is known as succinyl coenzyme A. Succinyl coenzyme A. Now, from my understanding, you do not need to remember these names specifically. It would be good to obviously remember the steps and the names but you don't need to absolutely memorize them. What you definitely need to understand are the inputs and the outputs of a cycle, of a process, whatever that we're looking at, and we're keeping track of them right now. We've input acetylcoenzyme A. So far, we've gotten out acetylcoenzyme A. We've gotten out NADH right here, and we've gotten out CO2. So we have coenzyme A. This is, again, I'm going to just tell you it's a four-carbon molecule. For that reason, you expect what? You expect the release of something, the release of a carbon-containing CO2. So now we've released another carbon dioxide molecule, and in addition to that, I will tell you that we undergo yet another dehydrogenation of NAD plus to NADH. Just squeeze that in right over there. So again, keep track. We've made one, two NADHs. We've released one, two carbon dioxides, and keep in mind that this is going to happen twice because of that other um, acetylcoenzyme A that's doing the same exact thing, probably at the same exact time. Next, we're going to go on to our sixth molecule. Our sixth molecule is known as succinate. And succinate, I'll tell you, is also a four-carbon compound. So we'll keep track of those carbons. Um, during this process, and this is a very, very important step, very important step, something that I would actually remember going from succinyl coenzyme A to succinate is an important step because what do you think it yields? It yields a very important molecule, and that is ATP. It goes ADP, becomes phosphorylated into ATP. This is very important. Now, notice I only wrote one ATP molecule, but overall, how many ATPs do you think come out of the citric acid cycle? Not one, but two, because we have to do this again for the other acetylcoenzyme A molecule that we have. Moving forward, we go from succinate into our seventh, which is our second to last um, molecule. And our seventh molecule is known as fumarate. Fumarate is a four carbon molecule as well. So we'll keep track of that. And we do have a byproduct here as well. Through this reaction, we actually create, um, this is the first time we see this, an FAD molecule, which is turning into, and you should know this, FADH2. This is something you should know. We are keeping track of the things that we've created. Again, we've created an NADH. We've, create, we've released CO2 also, created another NADH here, released CO2 here, created ATP, created FADH2. This is something that we're going to, don't be too worried, we're going to actually label all of this out in a nicely, very nicely formatted um, chart, and I also provide one on the site as well. That'll make things very clear. Overall, right now, let's just understand the, the basis behind the cycle. So we've created FADH2. Again, I'm not going to tell you the details. You don't need to know why we've made this just yet. We'll get into that. But just know that it's a high-energy compound. NADH is a high-energy compound that we'll use later. These are all going to be used later. Then we turn into our eighth and final part of our citric acid cycle, which is a malate molecule. And that malate molecule will um, actually turn back into an oxaloacetate molecule, creating a citric acid cycle, CAC. This is our citric acid cycle for that reason. Um, when we go from fumarate to malate, we don't need to label anything on the byproduct side of it. But from malate to oxaloacetate, we actually do create one more NADH molecule. So I'm going to do that right here. So I'm going to, whenever you create an NADH molecule, you start from NAD and you turn it into NADH, of course. So what have we done? We've created one, two, three NADH molecules for one molecule of acetylcoenzyme A. So you actually have created six. You've created one FADH2, multiply that by two, that's two, and you've created two ATP. So overall, we can quickly summarize the citric acid cycle on the side over here, just like we've done so far for everything else. Um, the summary is that we've gotten one glucose molecule, and we've turned it 
um, we have to remember that this actually goes undergoes two citric acid cycles. Don't forget that. That's a theme that we've talked about many times over. In addition, this cycle involves no ATP usage. We have never had to put in ATP anywhere. If we put in ATP, we would not expect ADP turning into ATP. It would actually be the opposite, ATP turning into ADP. That would be inputting ATP. We only did that in what phase? Glycolysis. What phase of glycolysis? The investment phase. And that's the only time we're ever going to input ATP. In addition, we've produced uh, a couple of things, and we can label them out as four carbon uh, dioxide molecules. And you can measure that out as you go through the cycle yourself. Uh, we've labeled the six NADH molecules. We've proved that, and we've also done two NADH, two excuse me, uh, FADH2 molecules. And then what's that most famous thing that we've created? We've actually created um, two ATP molecules as well. The final note I want to add about the citric acid cycle is that at this point, and I'm just going to write this over here, um, this is something you should write in bold, glucose, the molecule of glucose, is completely oxidized. What do I mean by this? Simply speaking, you can state that at this point, after the citric acid cycle has completed, glucose has been completely broken down into the subcomponents that are things like acetylcoenzyme A, that are these final components, there is no longer a glucose molecule, any remnant of it anymore. Now we've finally created all these things like NADH, FADH2, and CO2, all these things. And now we can finally look at why we created these high energy molecules in the citric acid cycle, in pyruvate oxidation, in glycolysis. What's the point of an NADH molecule? What's the point of an FADH2 molecule? We'll see that now in the electron transport chain.